our study in Psalms 119 today. And the title of my message is, as always, Psalms 119. Um, and when I was preparing my message, I was preparing to go from Psalms 119, verse 41, all the way to verse 56. And I was studying, and I was preparing my message, and I realized halfway through, if I don't stop, we're not going to get out until 2 o'clock. And I know Ellie, she's going to be hungry by then, and it's going to be a rough time. So because of her, I decided to cut my message in half, so we can thank Ellie for that. But the one thing I like about Psalms 119 isn't the fact that it's the Bible, but it's the fact that it applies to our daily life. That each section, Psalms 119 is broken up through the alphabet, or the, the Hebrew alphabet. And each section deals with our lives and the Word of God. And it is, uh, the psalmist is praising God. He's writing a poem to God. And it, it's just the outflowing of his heart. And when you see his heart, you see a man who truly loves the Lord. And something that we ourselves need to emulate in our own lives. And so please turn with me to Psalms 119, and we're going to start at verse 41. Psalms 119, starting in verse 41. It says, Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually, forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak, I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands will, will my hands also I will lift up to your commandments which I love, and I'll meditate on your statutes. This is very familiar. This style, this, these words, it's very familiar. It's almost like he's repeating himself. But there's a couple aspects that are very different that I want to point out to us. We're going to go verse by verse. But before we do that, let's open the word of prayer. Father God, as I strive to explain your word, give me clarity of mind, clarity of thought, Clarity of speech, Lord. Lord, open our hearts to what your word has to say and show us how it applies to our lives so we may live honorably to you. We ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalms 119, verses 41 to 42 is the first two verses we're going to look at. And I like to call this resting in the arms of God. Resting in the arms of God. Verses 41 and 42 says this. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. We have two words here. We have salvation and mercies. They're, they're the same thing. They're synonyms. What he's asking is rescue from his enemies. He's asking rescue from his enemies. And we see that in verse 2. It says, So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me. Now he is never clear on the who is the enemies. We were that he's, he's never clear on who his enemies are. We can't say it's the Philistines or the Canaanites or the Edomites or the Babylonians. Or the Egyptians, or the Syrians. We, we, we have no clue whose enemies are. We do know that they're enemies. And what he is seeking is rescue. And the way he's seeking rescue, it says, let, let you rescue me according to your word. He can read it. Let you rescue me according to your word. And the word here, a lot of us want to say, well, the word Bible. We say the word of God. 
But he's not referring to the Bible. He's referring to promises. What he's saying is, Lord, rescue me because you promised you would. Lord, save me because you said you would save me. <laughs> when children say, can I play a game with you tonight? And we say, sure, tonight we'll play a game. And then you go and do your stuff and you're doing, then it gets down to bedtime and they go, well, can we play a game? Oh, no, you know, it's, it's too late. Well, you said you would. And also we're faced with a choice. Yeah, we did promise that we we're going to play a game, but we caught up, got caught up doing things. And now they're asking to play that game that we promised them. They're really looking for you to keep your word. They trusted you. The parents said this, and they trust their parents. Well, my mom said she'd play a game with me, and well, about to go to bed, so obviously we're going to play a game now. I wonder what it's going to be. Many times, we have to tell them, oh, no, see, it's 7.30, and you, you know, it, it's bedtime now. It's time for you to go to bed. And then they get disappointed, and they get discouraged, and they start crying and throwing a fit, and we don't understand why. It's 7.30, don't they realize it's 7.30, it is bedtime? Well, what they see is they were told one thing, and they gave another. That's not the way it is with God. The psalmist is doing the same thing like a young child looking up to their mom, their dad, saying, Save me because you said you would. Save me because you know what you told me you're going to. That's what the psalmist is. It's a pure love and trust in God. Saying, I trust that you're going to save me because you told me you're going to. Then in verse 2, it goes on to say this. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me. If you look at Psalms 20, 19, 21 through 22, it says this. You rebuke, you rebuke the proud, you, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. This verse here, enemies, is referring back to these verses. The ones who don't love God, the ones who don't care for the commandments of God, the ones who are enemies to God are his enemies. Who they are, we don't know who specifically they are, but we know what kind of person they are. Ones who hate God. Ones who turn their back on God. And he says, So I shall have an answer for those who do not love God, for I trust in your word. Again, this promise, your word, is not talking about Scripture. It is talking about the promises that God has made. Now, we do find those promises in Scripture. But what he's saying here is, Lord, save me. <coughs> Because you said you would, and my enemies won't have any. When we, when people are younger, I got beat up a lot. I just, when I was in the elementary school, junior high, a kid named Ken Riley chased me around the playground, and I know it's hard to believe, but I wasn't the fastest kid on the block. And so, as I'm huffing and puffing. Here comes long, lanky Kent. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Hops on top of me. Starts beating me away. And I said, my dad's going to get you. Now, let's be honest. My dad is not going to say, oh, little boy, I'm going to beat you up now. You know, that, that doesn't happen. You know, that, my dad would be sent to prison. But we use terms like that. You know, my dad's going to get you. You just wait. Or my big brother's going to come, and he's going to show you how it is. You know, we have someone who's going to have our back. And the psalmist says this. Enemies, be careful, because you know what? God has my back. I don't need to worry about you, because God has my back. Do you know how I know he has my back? He told me he does. Think about when you were with your friends, and you go, hey, you got my back, bro? Yeah, I got your back. I said that many times, knowing that there's a fight, I'm running I'm like, oh, I don't think so. I'm comfort sensitive. 
But God has our back. We can cry out to God and say, Lord, save me. And I know you're going to because you said you would. We can rest in the arms of God because he said we could. Then going on to verses 40, 43 to 45, it says this. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances, so shall I keep your law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. Safety with the Lord. Not only can we rest in the arms of the Lord, we have safety with the Lord. In verse 43, it says, words of truth. It says, and take not the word of truth. Now again, the word of truth, what is truth? God is Jesus' is truth, the word of God, right? No. Now that is true. I would agree that. Yes, that is true. But here it's not talking about the Bible. It's talking about the promises that God is going to be there for us, that He has our back. And those are the words of truth. And he says that God promises in the, in the Old Testament that if you follow after him, if you follow these 613 rules that he set up through the law of Moses, that God will protect his people. Not only would protect his people, they were given special blessings. That if the Israeli people did certain offerings, if they did certain things, that God would bless them beyond wildest imaginations. That he would protect them from their enemies. That he will be a hedge around him. That he will be like a, a shed in a cucumber field. And with that, when he, when he saw about that, it's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of a shack, a guard shack, in the middle of a cucumber field that you can see for miles around in every direction. So if someone's coming, the guard can come and get them. They say, I see you coming. You're not, you're not getting to this field. God says, I will be that for you if you follow after me. If you obey me, if you worship me, I will be your protector. I will be your resting place. Those are the words of truth that he's referring to. He's saying, God made these promises to me. There's promises I'm holding on to. And he says... Very clearly. And take not the word of truth, these promises, out of my mouth. It is, he says, utterly, or utterly out of my mouth. And this is a beautiful picture. He says, never keep me from being able to speak truth. Never keep me from being able to speak the truth. It's like telling a, a little child a secret. I got mommy a present. Two minutes later, mommy, guess what daddy has for you? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, but it's a birthday card. <laughs> and in that birthday card, there's a gift certificate to Blockbuster. <laughs> you know, you, you, you tell a child a secret, and they're going to tell the first person they find, I'm not supposed to tell you this, so I'm not going to tell you that we're going to have chicken for dinner tonight. <laughs> Never keep me from being able to speak the truth. What he's saying is don't let me stop. Don't give me a reason to stop telling everyone about your promises. Don't let me stop spilling the secret, spilling the beans. I always want to be able to say, these are the promises of God. And then we have trust and hope again. For I have hoped in your ordinances. I have hoped in your ordinances. And this goes back to verses 41 and 42, where it says, Let your mercies also come to me, your salvation according to word. For you have answered me, who reproaches me. For I trust in your word. Again, he's saying, I'm always going to speak your truth. Why? Because I trust you. 
I have hope. I've placed my hope in you and you alone. What he's saying in verse 43 is this. Don't make me a liar. I'm telling everyone about your promises. Don't make me a liar. Don't make me a liar. I have my hope. I'm telling people about my hope, my confidence. Don't make me a liar. And then, going to verse 44, it says this. So I shall keep your law continually forever and ever. This is a promise to obey. He's saying, don't make me a liar. But I'm always going to obey you. I'm always going to follow after you. I'm always going to do what you want me to do. And that's hard. So I shall keep your, your law continually forever and ever. Don't make me a liar. Now this isn't you do this and I'll do that. He's saying I'm always going to speak your truth. And I'm always going to follow you. It's very straightforward. And then verse 45 and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your <coughs> precepts. The walk at liberty is a unique term. It says, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. This walking at liberty, what it means is a broad plane. Able to see all around you, spotting your enemies from afar. I can't see very good at night. And I was driving, I was following Katie, and I said, why are we turning here? Shouldn't we be turning right? And she's like, do you not know where you are? It's 109, John. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see. Hey, why am I driving? That's a good question. I didn't have my glasses on, which leads to another good question. But what this is, is I drive in with a giant spotlight with no obstacles in your way. To be able to see all around you, 360 degrees, and be able to see if there's someone coming, you're not hindered. That you are able to go left, right, straight, backwards, anywhere, and nothing is hindered. There's no enemies around you. And if there was, you're not concerned because you know where they are. You're like, oh, I see the enemy over there. I should walk on over here. Oh, enemy over here, I'm gonna walk this way. He's at liberty to go where he pleases because God is his rest. God is his safety. He's able to see his enemies from afar. Why is he able to do this? For I seek your precepts. I know, God, that if I follow you, you have my back. I don't need to worry about anything because I am secure with you. You are my rest and I have safety with you. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that we have safety with God. And he goes from talking about rest and talking about safety and he goes then to praising the Lord. Verse 46. Verse 46 says this, I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. He's saying, I'm going to talk about what God has done. The testimonies is, I'm going to tell what God has done in my life. We all have a testimony. We all have a beautiful testimony. See, when people give their testimony, they come up, they grab a microphone, make sure this is not, and they go, I was saved two years ago. And he saved me from sin. And we all get on the edge of sin. Who's sin? What kind of sin? Let me tell you what God has saved me from. Oh, here we go. This is going to be good. I was a drug dealer. I would, And we get excited because we hear all these wretched things this person has done. And we love those stories. We love hearing about how evil and wicked they were. And then they take five minutes and then God saved me. And I'm here today. Oh, praise Jesus. And we all get excited. And then we have someone give a testimony 
Well, I was saved at the age of five, and I followed the Lord ever since. Oh, that was nice. You can sit down now. Let's make a movie about that guy who did all those evil things. See, what it is, is we, we like the testimony, but we like hearing how evil they were. It's almost that like we get a taste of how bad they're all. Oh, that's a bad guy. But do we realize that the best testimony someone can say is this? I was saved at the age of three and lived for God continually. That, he, that person didn't have to go through the, the problems, the addictions, the pain, the heartache, <laughs> because they followed God and they had rest and safety. What a testimony that would be. Now, if your testimony is that God saved me from this and that, praise God how great God is. That God saved each and every one of us. We all have a testimony, and that is a testimony of God's love for you. And no one can change that testimony. You should be proud of your testimony, be it one of great sin before salvation. Or be it, I was saved at a young age and I followed the Lord and everything in between. We have a testimony. No one can shut that down. No one can say, Becky, that's not true. No one can say, Katie, I don't know you. It's your story, your life. You've experienced God's power. And the psalmist says, I will say what God has done. I will proclaim, I will speak of your testimonies. He says, also before kings. And the kings, it doesn't mention the king. It doesn't say the king of Babylon, the king of Syria. It just says kings. And I think what it's saying is this. Is he's not ashamed. Go on to verse 46. It says, and I will not be ashamed. It's very clear. It says, I don't care who it is who's in front of me. If the president of America comes and says, tell me about yourself. I'll be glad to. When I was 16 years old, I was at a choir of the fire youth rally. A man gave a, a gospel presentation, told me that I was a sinner going to hell. And that Jesus was the only way to cover my sins, to pay my penalty. And I gave my life to Jesus. I accepted his gift of salvation. And I'm able to stand here today and say, God has saved me from my sin. And I'm going to heaven for eternity. I should not be ashamed of that. I shouldn't be like, oh... Well, Mr. President, you know, you know I, I'm moving to Wadesboro, and you know, I have a job there, you know. Tell me about yourself. No, I should boldly stay where I am, plant my feet and say, this is who I am. I am a new creation in Christ. It shouldn't matter who it is. You should always be bold and give your testimony. How else will they know about God? So, tell me about yourself. I'll be glad to. Let me tell you how I'm a new creation. Be it a job interview, be it with a president, a manager, doesn't matter. We should be bold in proclaiming who we are in Christ. And then, in verses 47 and 48 says, And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. This is just a beautiful praising and outpouring of praise for what God has given us. His commandments, His Bible, His way that we should live. Do we not realize that we have instructions on how we should live for life? I think this is a corny illustration, but uh, the B-I-B-L-E... Basic instructions before leaving earth. But it's true. We have his commandments. We have his word to tell us how we should live. This should be the greatest praise on our lips. That we don't have to wonder. I wonder what God wants me to do. We don't have to wonder that. We don't have to go, well, does God want me to do this or that? We have his instruction manual. Read it. The Psalms will say, I'm so happy. That I have the Bible that I can know what God wants me to do. So I can have rest in Him and safety in Him. And I can praise Him for that. This passage in Psalms shows us that we have rest in the arms of God. We have safety with the Lord. And we can praise the Lord. Yet, 
We look for rest, safety, and praise everywhere but the Word of God. When we look for rest, some people go, you know what? Life is just too much for me right now. I just need to go on a vacation. I just need to escape. Well, I know not. vacations are good. I'm going on a vacation this summer. I can't wait. I'm going to see Katie's parents. I'm going to see my parents. Katie's parents live at the beach. My parents have a private beach. One is the ocean. One is a lake that is clear, like 20 feet down. Some people even use it for drinking water, which is crazy. You fish in the bathroom in the lake. Let's think about that. I don't want to be drinking that jazz. I don't go to my goldfish bowl. But I'm looking forward to that vacation. But I'm not doing an escape from my life. I'm doing it because, you know what? I just want to have some time with my family. Vacation's fine, but if you're using it to escape from your life, you can't escape from your life. Your problems are going to follow you everywhere you go. Some people look to escape, say, you know what, I just need to sleep in. I just can't handle this. No, I love sleeping in. It's great to sleep in. Before we had kids on a Saturday morning, 10, 11 o'clock, you wake up, you're like, hey, hey, this is great. 5.30 comes around, everyone's still asleep, you're like, hey, hey, this is great. <laughs> Sleeping in is great, but some people who struggle with depression because life is just too much for them, they use it as an escape. And that's not healthy. Some people just need time off from work. I just, need, I just can't do be here right now. And they leave work, they just can't handle it. They're trying to escape. Some people use drinking, drugs. Others just sit in front of a TV all night because they just can't handle life. It's just too much. They just need to zone out. Watching TV is great. Of course, Cooks in America, that's a fun show. HGTV, there's a channel. And if you're lucky, they just show uh, Fixer Upper all day long, every day. So it's even better. Chip and Joanna, here I come. But if I'm using that as an escape from reality, that's wrong. I shouldn't look to escape from reality. If I need to rest, if I have life is just overcoming and just I can't handle it, I should turn to the Word of God. His promises to help me. Philippians chapter 4, where He will give me His peace if I seek after Him. James chapter 1, saying that if I have problems, seek out wisdom. Instead of trying to escape, through man's ways, I should look for rest in the Word of God. Other times, we look for safety. Well, safety is found with the Lord. But yet, many times, we find safety in money. I just need a big enough bank account so if something happens, I'm protected. I just need to make sure I have enough money to cover this so that I don't have to worry about anything. Well, you're trying to find safety in a perishable thing. We say, no, I'll be fine as long as I have this job. If I have this job, all my problems will disappear. And we get that job and our problems don't disappear. You know, we say, if I just have friends, if I just have a good group of friends, I'll be fine. They'll have my back. But if there's a fight, don't count on me. I'm running the other way. <laughs> Again, I'm uh, comfort sensitive. See, we, we try to find safety in friends and popularity. We just say, if I just had this kind of house or if I had this kind of property. But we're putting our hope in perishable things. We're putting our hope in man-made devices. Now, it is not a problem to go on vacation and watch TV. I'm not saying that's not bad. That's, that's an okay thing as long as you're not trying to escape. And it's great to be able to say, I'm able to save money, I have a good job, I have wonderful friends. Those are fine, but don't put your trust in them. Don't put all your eggs in their basket. Because you know what? Friends will turn away. A job can disappear. Your money can be stolen. But we can always find safety in God, and He'll never let us down. Job when he, he was the richest man at the time on earth, when you look at all the 
he had. He had family, he had friends, he had money, he had land, he had everything you could ever want. And God took everything away. Everything was stripped from him. And what he did, he turned to God. His wife said, you should curse God and die. And he said, you're a moron. Actually, the word is fool. And he said, she, he goes, God is the one <laughs> thing I have. He is my rest. He's my safety. I will hold on to God because that is not going to go away. Our safety is found in God. Our rest is found in God, in the Word of God. And praise. We love praising ourselves. We love lifting ourselves up. There's only one we should lift up. It's God. We love to be able to say, look at the vacation I'm able to go on. Look at the job I have. Look how big my bank account is. Now, we don't ever say that, right? We don't walk around and go, want to see my bank statement? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, what, what? We don't say that. There's a time at churches, the way you'd know how much money people had was the hat that the ladies would wear. The fancier the hat, well, the higher society they have. You know, I'm just imagining people not being able to see in front of them because there's big hats everywhere. <laughs> but we don't do that anymore, right? But there's other ways that we try to show how well off we might be. And the Corinthian church, the church in Corinth, they had the same problem. That women and men were dressing a certain way, doing their hair in a certain way to show wealth and privilege. And God says, don't do that. Don't lift yourself up. Lift me up. See, when we find rest and safety in man-made things, we're going to be praising man and lifting others up. We're going to see someone who comes in wealthy and fancy and flashy, and we're going to put him in the place of honor. But when you find rest and safety in God, you're going to automatically praise God. We have a choice. We can either try to find rest and safety in God and praise Him. Or we can find rest and never find it. Find safety and never find it. And praise man and be empty if we do it our own way. One leads to fulfillment and a full heart in life. One leads to emptiness and want. What are you going to choose today? Are you going to find rest in God? Or are you going to look for it somewhere else? Are you going to find safety in God? Or something else? Are you going to praise God? Or man? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you promise us rest. <coughs> that you promise that we'll be safe in your arms. And for that, Lord, I praise you. I praise you that you are my God that I can rest and lean upon you in times of trouble and know that I'm safe. Lord, when I stray, when I start resting and looking for safety in man-made things, bring me back to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where are you finding rest and safety? <coughs> God.